Welcome to Champion Minded, the podcast for those who aim for excellence, not only in the sports arena, but in life. My name is Alistair McCaw, author, speaker, mindset and performance coach, and my goal is to help you unleash your unlimited potential and provide you with the tools to achieve greatness. Are you ready to become Champion Minded? Then let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's the Champion Minded Podcast. I'm Alistair McCaw. In this episode, we're talking Formula One, which is a great passion of mine. It's my pleasure to welcome Enrique Bonaldi back onto the show for the second time. Enrique raced for the Arrows team back in 2000 and 2001. In fact, his teammate at the time was Jos Verstappen, of course, the father of Max. Enrique raced 29 races and was also the test driver for BAR Honda. So I wanted to uh, get Enrique onto the show to discuss obviously the first half of the season. We've just had Belgium uh, this past weekend, which was obviously pretty interesting to say the least. It's the shortest race in history. In fact, the race didn't even happen. It was three laps behind the safety car. So I really wanted to get him onto the show to hear his thoughts and opinions of what happened and of course I had a few other questions for him as well in in terms of what he misses from racing, the mindset of racing in difficult conditions, teammates and we chat a little bit about of course Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen as well. So if you're a Formula One fan then you're going to enjoy this one. So here he is, here's Enrique Binaldi. Enrique welcome back to the Champion Minded Podcast. Hey, my friend, it's always nice to, to chat with you, and it's a pleasure for me. Halfway into the, the Formula One season, the 2021 season, it's obviously been a crazy last two years, last season. Uh, yesterday was Spa Frank Bashar, which was, <laughs> um, how do I describe it? One of the, a, a race I've never seen before, and, and for it to actually be categorized as a race with three laps behind a safety car. What were your thoughts on it? I think, I think, um, Alistair, I think uh, Spa is a track that um, even with the, the safety improvements during the years is, is a track that um, I remember first time I went to drive there, Formula One, I met Michael Schumacher uh, getting into the paddock and he said, uh, today we'll like it because that's a track that in a Formula One car separates the boys from the men because there you risk you risk a lot especially in corners like Rouge, like Blanchiment in the in the in the wet is a track that is incredible demanding uh concentration wise because you're going so fast in order not to be with a ridiculous time you need to push on those dangerous uh, places so i did a qualifying uh qualifying in 2001 there in the wet and it's really it's, it's very stressful i think Yes, in the situation to 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 do only three laps behind the safety car. I think that was a tentative to see how the especially with the with especially with the spray is difficult to see. I think it was a tentative the, the 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 race director tried to see if drivers then he gets he can see the he can listen to every radio he can listen to every conversation. Uh, there is a lot going on in the radio, especially because the radio is now live for the all worldwide. And um, if you ask me in the past, people raced in similar conditions. Yes, they did. Hockenheim, 88, Senna drove in a tremendous rain, very dangerous track, also very fast. Uh, lately, they haven't raced in that those difficult situations. To say it was possible to race, I don't know. For sure, would be difficult, would be challenging. You have to consider a lot of factors. For instance, uh, after Norris crash on, sa- on Saturday at the Rouge, the radio Vettel's, Sebastian Vettel's radio comments after doesn't make the race more possible in the rain. Because if a da- driver, which is four times world champion, starts saying, screaming on the radio, I told you, I told you, red flag, red flag, why to do this? You put some pressure on the on the race director you know there is people that cannot afford for instance max cannot afford to have a crash and lose another engine. 
So there is a, a lot of um, factors, a lot of uh, economic factors which get involved. You know, if I if I can just come in there, you know, something that that takes me back is obviously 1992 and Imola, the infamous incident with Senna and Roland Ratzenberger. And the drivers were complaining bitterly that that week as well of how unsafe the track was, how unsafe some corners were. So what you're saying right now is, like you said, when a multiple world champion like Sebastian, come, Sebastian comes onto the radio and says, you know, I told you, red flagged, some other drivers are complaining, that, then it does put a lot of pressure on Michael Massey. But I mean, what I'm trying to get my head around is how can they award points for three laps sitting behind the safety car now they're obviously half points but still it's points somebody like fernando alonso is in p11 who doesn't get any points but he didn't have an opportunity to to, to challenge for points is it a fair system yes no I, I i disagree with that i disagree to especially for the public you know imagine imagine somebody has been a year and a half uh, without being able to go to a Formula One race, they are max more or less they have their home hero because he lives right. He used to live right up around the border. Jos used to live in Belgium while he was uh, my teammate, and Max grew up there. Max raised his whole career in, in a go kart career in Belgium, in gang, uh, very famous go kart tracks. Uh, it's. Uh, I think that's that's not fair for the public. That's not fair for the, for drivers. Like as you said, as you you're correct, Alonso he would have a good a real good shot yesterday because it's a very difficult track in the rain. Normally, the better, more skilled, experienced driver would have a better chance. Probably he would be on the points. Maybe not. Maybe he would crash on the straight line. It can happen. You can aquaplane. You can you can crash just be, before even you know. There's many many many. Examples, yeah, uh, Paris crashed, bringing the car to the grid in the rain. Max, last year in Hungary, crashed, bringing the car to the grid in the rain. Prost, 92 in Imola, spun in a Ferrari in the formation lap, 91, 92, I think 91, and didn't race. And the guys four times were champions. So uh, once you start a, a, a race in a, such a difficult track, in such conditions, it's like flipping the dice, you know? Uh, what well, if, we saw, if we saw at Spa, I think it was on Friday, the, the women's, uh, they call it what, the W W one's uh, uh, formula? The, I think World Series, yes. World Series, yes, something like that. And yes. we saw that accident uh, where five, six cars at the same corner just completely just, you know, spun yes. off the track and it was a pretty serious accident. In fact, yes. if the halo wasn't on one or two of those cars, it could have been a lot more, more serious. Yes. Yes, the hail the hail is playing a big part uh, for sure. Uh, the, the they could get being serious injuries um, on, on Friday there. Uh, we have seen a few years ago also in GP two a crash in Rouge. The um, the French guy uh, passed away. So it is a dangerous place. Yes, Spa is a dangerous place. So Rouge is dangerous. It's not by coincidence that is the most challenging corner in FA one and. In the rain would have been difficult. Would have been. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm. I'm the same way. It's agreeing with you. Saying shouldn't have uh, award any points. Should try to race maybe, but would have been a difficult situation for sure. It's, it's not. It's not easy. Um, there is always both sides. I mean, it for has... me, for me, the halo has to be the best change to Formula One in the beginning. Now, at first, being a traditionalist, having watched uh, a Formula One since the eighties, um, you know, at first when they wanted to change it to the halo and I was like, no, no, this is just going to make the car look ridiculous. You know, this is just not formula one anymore, but you know, you quickly got used to it. It's, it, it actually looks okay. Um, of course, the most important thing is the safety factor. And what was so ironic was, I think it was one or I think it was the first or second race after that introduced the halo. There was that accident with, with uh, Charles Leclerc. And I think it was Alonso that went, went over him in that, in Spa, right? Yeah, on the start, I yeah. think. Yeah. And that was, that was a great example of, you know, because you saw in slow motion the car actually go over the head of, yes. of Charles Leclerc and the Alpha. That could have been a serious a serious uh, accident. As well. I'm, I'm sure uh, Grosjean, Romain Grosjean is alive because of the halo. With the guardrail fading the, in the lower part, how many times we have seen drivers being decapitated 
because that's what happens. The halo saved his life. He, he had a, a lot of luck to be alive because not to be under the guardrail, to be able to come out, to be had the space to come out. But the number one uh, factor that kept him alive is the halo because the guardrail would have hit straight to his head and he wouldn't be here now. I mean, I, I was watching that race live and, you know, we saw the same pictures as, as yeah. you know, everyone else, but it's a fireball in the back and, yeah. and, you know, you obviously heard Charles Leclerc on the radio to say that was a big one. And, and when those guys say it's a big one and you've seen, I'm sure some serious yeah. accidents yourself in the car, you know, when something is serious. Yes. Yes. That, that, that was, that was serious. That comment from Leclerc was, uh, was really was, uh, was legit. The comment from, Coming back to this week, this weekend, coming uh, the comments from from Vettel about Norris crashed, I think is a little bit overreacting, honestly, because we have seen crashes at Ohuju, we have seen Villeneuve, Zanardi, Zonta. I can you, you can number it, many. I'm sure you know any others crashes there. Is 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 a is a crash? Is a light threatening crash? No, it's not. It's, it looks impressive because the car is hitting is hitting hard, but is a spin sliding through the asphalt. So, of course, it's slowing down a little bit. I think that's a little bit overreacting. And I think that comment made, uh, guided towards the result that we saw yesterday, not to race. Yeah, because they say, and you would know this uh, is, you know, full impact is, is the worst type of accident where, you know, you saw Schumacher's accident at, at Silverstone where he went straight, straight ahead. We saw that with, Max as well um, at Sil at Silverstone as well I think it was um, what was it like a fifty three g impact yeah because every time you hit and you stop you feel in your body I I experienced that uh, I experienced a, a hitting like maybe at hundred and fifty kilometers an hour and the car stops and it hurts and you feel the motion of the car going your brain feels like it's getting a uh, it hurts you get like we in your ears for some hours and i hit uh 200 three, uh, 220 miles an hour in an oval in racing indycar and you just hit and you go for the next 500 meters yeah it hurts a little bit yes but as long as nothing penetrates the cockpit you're fine to walk out and to to drive the car in the next half an hour so it's the it's Max is way more serious crash than what was uh, London Norris because he hit one side, then the car goes spinning, goes all the way to the other side. So if you the G force maybe is a little spike on the first hit, but it's not that it's nothing that will hurt him or he will give him any concussion protocol or anything. Yeah, like like you said, it just it looks a lot more spectacular to to us yeah. watching on on TV, but. Do you feel the spectators should get a, a refund from yesterday's race? Or is that something that, you know, Lewis, Lewis's comments saying that, you know, the spectators should get, get their money back. There was no race. Do, do you agree with those comments? Absolutely. Yes. Some, uh, absolutely. I think um, um, sometimes Lewis comments is not, he's a great driver, one of the best ever inside the car. Sometimes he makes comments, which I don't agree. But this one, I, I agree 100%. I think, especially coming out, uh, Alistair, after one year of one year and a half of COVID races where it was no public, I think out of respect, they stay there in the rain. They stay there in the cold. Spa is cold in summer. All day. In, all, yeah, day. all day, wet, all weekend camping, I think, uh, I think would be uh, the right thing to do. Do you think they'll do it or... Or do you think that that train is, has already gone through the station? <laughs> uh, I think. I suppose we'll know in the I next think, few I days, think, right? I think. I think. No, no. I think the train is already passed. <laughs> I think yes, it's an it's another thing. And now everything now is about Zenford. Is is next week? You know, I think. And then it's all forgotten. It's quickly yeah. forgotten. It's now it's going on up to another Max Verstappen home. They even changed the signs from them. The, the speed limit on the streets is not 30 anymore. Now it's 33. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, you've been to, you know, you speak Dutch. I, I've been, I raised the Marlboro Masters there. It's Anatic. incredible. It's crowd. It's, it's only a Formula 3 race. Uh, I, I had my problems with yours. I, we tried to do a, 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 a exhibition there with Formula 1 car in 2001. 
and yours was my rival and we didn't like it, it was clear my, my rival and every time it was impossible for me to get out from the box because every time I would walk to the to the um, to the pit wall all the supporters would scream Bernaldi wanker Bernaldi wanker <laughs> so they took me out they said you came here but we can't use you so I, it's, I, such I, an, it's such an interesting dynamic and I know we have uh, because of Netflix Formula One is it has increased its popularity with by something like 30 something percent which is massive especially with younger viewers so the drive to survive series um mm. and you guys know being inside that a lot of it is hollywood it's a lot of it is just not a lot exactly exactly but for but for us or should i say some who don't know it's spectacular you know just um the, the way it's being put together now. and and the bottom line is it's increased the the interest in formula one which is which is the best thing you know what's going on behind the the, the background about the teammates is that that is your number one rival and and it's the fact that they call it a teammate is funny you know you uh you were with yours yours for step and there was max ever around at that that stage yep. yes some races yes uh, Sophie's mother, we, we, Victoria was uh, just a newborn and Max was, I think, three or four years old. Um, yeah, he was coming around sometimes, yes. Yos, Yos was pretty close to Michael, wasn't he? Yeah, Yos was, yes. Yes, he was, uh, yes, he was a good friend of Michael, yes. Right. Um, mindset. Now, this is where I want to go on to a race like yesterday. It's pouring with rain. You, you've been in races where it's been raining pretty heavy. What is your mindset before a race? Are you are you concerned? Are you holding back? Or are you thinking to yourself, great, this is a great opportunity to, to do something? Depends a little bit, uh, Alistair. It depends on the, your mindset, depends a lot on your car. How is the performance of your car, right? And how is how you have been performing? How has been your previous race? What the team expects? Um, for sure, to be racing, if I was there, to race at Spa in the rain. I would see as a, for my drive, I, I always love to drive in the rain. I, I performed well in the rain. So I would like it. If, I, if I'm driving in a, in a team, let's say that I would start from P11 to P20, it's a chance, it's a realistic chance. It's, but you have to be very, very focused. Your mindset cannot be a mindset like, uh, okay, I will attack straight away because you can, you don't know where you're standing. You don't know where the pedals are. You need to get to, to you need to, to settle in to do some laps because uh, the same way that you can risk and you can go from P15 to P3 in the first lap, that can happen. You can be sticking the wall on the first corner and you then, it, then it's a real problem because you're already not performing in qualifying and you stick the car in the wall in the first corner. It's So the mindset has to be very, very focused. And um, it's a lot in the rain. It's very, very unpredictable. The, so the, would, would, you, uh, would you say that definitely being in a, in a slower car, you're a little bit more optimistic and excited that it, you got an opportunity in poor conditions, etc. cetera? The, the easiest, the guy that would have the easiest life yesterday, undoubtedly, would be Max Verstappen. Because he's driving a very stable car, a fast car, and he's ahead. So he doesn't have any spray on, he, he can see, at least he can see. The second guy would move out of his spray on the, on the other line, on the straight line, and he can see also on the straight line at least. The rest, they'll be blind. They don't know how, if they are 300 meters uh, before the, the breaking point, or if they are 200 meters, it's just, it's very difficult to get a reference. Plus if there is somebody on your side, the spray gets even higher. I, I raced in a situation similar in the old Hockenheim in front of 3000. It was pouring rain, old Hockenheim, huge straight lines. And um, I was starting P6. We turned the first corner. I could not see anything. I just, on the formation lap, I I, I tried to get some, 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 some references. I said, I never drove Hockenheim in the rain. So I said, I break on the 100 meters on the dry, probably in the, in the wet. I will break on 150 in a good lap. I, I tried to see where the 200 board was and I said, okay, I keep my foot on the gas until, the, until I see 200 board on the side looking uh, peripheral 
uh, because you have to look forward, but peripheral uh, vision, because you need to see where you are also. If there is cars, you can't see much. And um, yes, and it was really hard. I think the mindset has to be focused. I think it's a, it's a lottery. If they do the race, the race probably would be finished on time, not on, on laps. Would have been the race would last for two hours, and anything can happen. A slower car can. Do you think the right decision was made yesterday in Spa with it was just too dangerous that track to race on? I, I think so. Yes, I think uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy that I think you choose to be a race car driver. You choose to do a risking thing. You know, it's like you say, I go to the rain and I don't want to get wet. That doesn't happen. You go, you're going to drive a race car. You're risking your life. That's that's part of the game. I'm a big fan of brave drivers. I'm a big fan of tracks like Spa Francorchamps, old Hockenheim. I hate new tracks like new Hockenheim. I hate uh, this all this asphalt that you can do a mistake. Poor come Ricard. Back. Poor Ricard. Yes, you you never crash the car. You do a mistake, you come back. You you do you you miss the braking. You do you come back. You even you see guys don't even flat spot their tires anymore because they know. I just go straight and I come back. They even don't pay the price to lose the set of tire, which try to stay on the track. Yeah, I'm so not a big fan of that. I'm a big, I'm, I like old school. I like standing starts in the rain, but I think, yes, it was a bit too much, honestly. Did you, did you enjoy racing in Monaco? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. It is challenging. It's, it's nice. Yes, challenging for the head. Um, it's like taking, let's say, take a, a, a go-kart and drive around your living room. It's very tight. Yeah. Um, it is a, it's a lot of, a, Monaco is a lot of mindset, like believing. I believe I can point to hit the wall and I will miss it by an inch and that will make you a time. It's a lot of believing where you can put your car. It's a... Uh, I didn't like it. I, I was a big fan of tracks like Suzuka, Spa, uh, Old Hockenheim, where the race is uh, silvers on the fast part. Even though silvers on the race is boring before uh, before the wings could open, the race was boring because of the downforce. Nobody could follow anyone. But I was a big fan of those type of tracks. Um, Monaco never made my... Um, let, let's look forward to Zandvoort this weekend. Um, does the track... Has it been built for Max Verstappen? Is it is it a Red Bull track? I never raced Zandvoort in the big track. The way I raced on the remember in the past, Zandvoort has a he had a huge track. I think six kilometers big track, but that they think was dangerous before my time. So my time, Mobile Masters, we used to race in a very in a short version. I think uh, Formula Three was lapping uh, a minute one one minute. Formula Three was lapping a minute. Formula One would, would lap in like. 48 seconds if it was really really small i never drove the big track so I, I don't know i don't just know i just know how the track looks like because of my my son he plays playstation on the simulator and i uh, i played on the on the playstation it's difficult to say it's, you know it's like um it's difficult to say like to say oh this track is built for that car mm. we never know and to say oh, oh this guy knows this track because he's from there better than the others doesn't when you're at that level, Alistair, once, let's say Max raced there his whole life, he might know where to put his wheel in some special, in some specific corner, but Hamilton, after 10 laps, he will know he can be as fast as Max. So at those drivers, Leclerc can be as fast as Max. So uh, the, no, the knowledge of the track doesn't, doesn't influence at, at that level. So now, I think... Go ahead. Let's see. Let's see how it will be. I think it will be... I think it will be an uh, interesting race because the track doesn't look very wide. The Formula, the, the Formula 1 cars now are very big, very wide, very long. long yeah. And um, I think it will be some crashes because especially one thing I know for sure is that I raced there two years, uh, Marlboro Masters, with the wind and the track and the, and the sand, the beach being so close, the track is always very sandy. So it's always very slippery and it changes a lot, even on the dry. And it gets it gets pretty windy there as well, because as we know, the North Sea, it's cold and windy, even even in, in summer. And we can see what what the Belgium 
end of summer was looking like this past weekend. It could be it could be similar in in um, in Zandvoort. In fact, what in fact what I'm doing right now, I'm actually uh, looking at the weather for Zandvoort this weekend, and there is rain predicted, and it's not such a bad actually weekend. Uh, 19 degrees Celsius. Um, but hey, sometimes we can't tell what the weather is going to be like this afternoon. So yes. it'll be it'll be interesting. Yeah. It'll be Michael, uh, yeah, no, there for sure. Uh, mornings the track is way better. Just after lunch, as you said, the wind picks up. The track goes two seconds like that, slower, and gets really slippery. I think setups will play a, a big a big part there. Yeah. I want to talk about Lewis. Um, now he's he's had undoubtedly the fastest car for, for the past six, seven years. This is the first year that he's really feeling uh, the biggest challenge coming from, from Max Verstappen at Red Bull. Do you think Lewis is feeling the pressure for the first time in a long time? And is he is he cracking in a way under it? Or what's your opinion? I think um, he's become a little bit more edgy in the press and he's become a little bit more not as cool and calm, if I can put it that way. But it's a, it's the first time that he's having a guy which is willing to do to take the risks as he would take the risks. Because when, when, when he lost the championship to, to Rosberg, he beat Rosberg three times, he lost once to Rosberg. Uh, Nico wasn't that guy that very aggressive like deep inside Lewis knew he would dominate that he would was faster that he would change take the the, the more aggressive maneuver he knew that we we, we, we know we as a driver we know our 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 conquer, our enemies our opponents we know them so we know how how aggressive how more or less and max was is very aggressive you can't say max is really really aggressive he's really fast and he's aggressive without doing mistakes. So he put Lewis in a very bad situation since the beginning of the season because he was going in. And you see, Silverson race one. Lewis get ahead, Max passing back without even looking to the mirror. Or Max has passed him in a start in Imola and push him out. Max was willing to do anything. But I think Silverstone race two, when, when Max had the crash, that was a turning point, I believe. Lewis showed that he is willing also to take the risk. Because honestly, in that corner, which was eight gear, flat out, to, be, to commit to a contact in a Formula One car needs a lot of balls, as you said, a lot from both. Max ignored him because the, Lewis had, uh, had the car on his side on half a, half a car in. So Max did not let, Max just thought, okay, I always throw my car in, he backs off. And that was a turning point. He didn't back off. And he was willing to go to the wall with Max if needed. So I think he's, of course, he's feeling the pressure. I believe the Mercedes car, it is a little bit faster than a, than a Red Bull car. I believe so. But uh, it will be a big, it will be a, very interesting fight until the end of the season. And he's under pressure, for sure. If he loses the championship now, people will say, well, first time you had a driver that really fought uh, inch by inch with you, you lost. So I think... A lot of people, you know, I'm a massive Formula One fan and, and a lot of people might say I'm, you know, pro Max Verstappen or pro Red Bull, whatever, but, you know, Lewis, Lewis Hamilton for me is the best driver, in my opinion, of, of all time. And, you know, why would you say that? A lot, a lot will say, well, he has the fastest car. He has, you know, of course, put anybody in the fastest car. But if we look at the amount of times that he's, he's crashed the car, it's not been much in seven years, six or seven years. And that for me is a, a great driver because obviously we know there's a lot of money involved. The teams don't like to see it when their car ends up in, 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 the, in the barriers every qualifying session. So, you know, he's, he's very consistent. I, I think he was one of the best, Alistair. I, I think he's, I don't think he's a Schumacher. I don't think he's Senna, mainly Senna. Uh, I think Senna had a 
mainly Senna had a more, not because I'm Brazilian, because I think Senna had a more difficult time than Schumacher had and then Lewis had. It's uh, on these days, on racing these days, it's one thing for you to fight the championship with your, with your team teammate. You can't do much of, you can't be 100% aggressive because the team will, if both crash, the guy which is not supposed to win wins, wins a race. So we have seen when, when Rosberg and Lewis crashed in, in Barcelona on lap one, Max won the race. And the team lost, lose a lot of money. Now there is plus the effect that they, can, they cannot uh, uh, afford to lose an engine. In a crash, you can hit and you can hit and you can damage the engine. It cannot be useful. It cannot be, be, you can't use the engine anymore. Like, like Verstappen engine from Silverstone. And uh, if you fight always two, three years with your teammate for the championship, it is a fair fight. Both had the same car. But if you are the best driver, like Lewis is, compared to Bottas and compared to Rosberg, Rosberg, he knew he would win deep inside. And the team knows he will win also because the team knows we give this material to Lewis, he's faster than, than Bottas. And he will win. He has a better, uh, more aggressive, better start, better uh, rhythm during the race. I'm, I'm a fan of the way Lewis drives because I remember... Uh, he won the championship on his second year, and then he, then McLaren for a couple of three, four years wasn't very good. They could finish third, fourth, win sometimes. And I remember one race in uh, in Monza, where Vettel was winning easy, and he was third, and he crashed in the last lap, mm. gave away a podium, crashed in the last lap. It means that he was pushing until the last lap. He couldn't get to second place. The fourth place couldn't catch to him, but means he's giving 100% every single lap. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate him as a driver. I think he's a, absolutely a great driver. I would think it's, of course, a difficult time, but I think Schumacher and Senna, it's, it's a little bit better. You said you think he's a better driver than Verstappen? I don't know. Max is really good. I, I don't know. I think the Mercedes car is a little bit easier to drive. Than uh, than uh, than a Red Bull. I definitely think that that Max and you know we we forget Max is already into his fifth season in in Formula One. I think um, 2016 was his first season, maybe. Uh, you know, he, I, think, I think more. I think he's it must have been around there. Yeah, I think he's around about 15 or 16. If I'm, uh, you know, he was what he was 17 when he had his first drive, right? Yeah. How old is he now? 23? I've, I've no idea, but I think it's, it's, I think it's about five or six, six years yeah. now. Yeah. Which, I would say maybe even seven, uh, something like that. Yes. Between five and seven, I, I would say. But he's definitely improved as a driver. He's more consistent. If you remember those first two years, uh, the crash at, at, at Monaco, the, you know, going into the back of, of his teammate and, and so on and so forth, you know, he's definitely in, in, improved his, his driving skills as well. We, we can see that. But moving on, because I want to be respectful of your time, uh, Enrique, okay. let me ask you this. What one rule would you change in Formula One today? Hmm. <laughs> I would bring back the V10 engines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rule, let's say. Um, was, that, was the V10 era, was that the, the Schumacher uh, 711? The yeah, tour? I know Schumacher. I think he started in a V8. Senna was, in a v, Senna was in a V12. Some you know, remember when we, we had tires, uh, we had like uh, V12s from Ferrari and Honda, uh, V10s from, from Renault and mm -hmm. some other teams, and then uh, the more the poorest teams with less budget they had uh, the, always the old Ford uh, V8 engines. I wouldn't go that far to to have this much difference, but um, I think I think the I think Formula One, you know, it's uh, how can you say it's something that it is powerful. Yes, at the moment I don't see how they can do anything electric to generate that power that will last for two hours. So it's uh, why not to have the really really like a beast engine behind something that when when you switch on. 
People five miles away hears it. Public loves it. More difficult to drive. There's no coasting. It's everything flat out. I think that that he needs that. I think um, I think I think yes. I think also we see some overtaking maneuvers that some drivers get credit for with the wing open, and that's not really realistic. If the wing would not be open, eighty uh, percent of the overtakings wouldn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I I was I was just in in Monaco about four or five weeks ago, and I went to the the museum there or with the or the car collection. I think it's the Prince Albert car collection, and I was having a look at uh, is it was it Senna's car there. And I remember seeing that onboard lap of him at Monaco, which is where he describes it of being in a tunnel, just that tunnel vision or zone or whatever you want to call it, where, you know, he was just, he was so far happy, so far ahead, he was going to lap Prost in the same car. And then when the team told him to slow down, that's when he got thrown out of his, thrown out of his, uh, out of his zone, so to say, but, you know, just how raw those cars were and for me formula one is sound for me formula one like you said is the sound of an engine i mean yes. if it goes to electric i don't think i'll be a fan anymore I, I've, I've got to admit i understand about um green uh, you know ozone and so on and so forth but formula one to me is is just that yes. that rawness and and if you also had to look back then the steering wheel there was no buttons on it it was just pure radio radio driving. radio yes it was radio and and, and sometimes the radio, because of the technology back then, sometimes the radio didn't, didn't work. Really work. Yeah, you, you, we, we had to look. Also, in my time, we had to look on the pit boards. Sometimes you wouldn't get information. You look on the pit boards. There is not like now. Now, if you, uh, I was, um, I was in Azerbaijan uh, working as a race steward for the race, and we have access to every radio of every driver live simultaneously while they're driving. Well, the formation app, I put a lot of a lot of radios on and I was listening because I go as a driver. So I, I try, I get curious to see what they are doing, what they're talking. And it's things that I never heard. It's like uh, torque for a uh, braking map to warm up your brakes on qualifying or on, on formation lap. Uh, and then you change this. It's, it's like a computer stuff. And you see the message that comes sometimes when we can see the dashboard. It's it, things that I never saw. All codes. It is all codes, and it's like uh, keep, um, keep this. Uh, give me more power. At my time, you had to choose your power yourself. It's mixed from one to seven. You go to seven, you have more power. If you keep mix seven for two laps, you're gonna blow up the engine. It's, it's, it's on you. It's like it's more natural. Like we were we were not guided that much. What I think, I mean, we, we look at those steering wheels today. Do you have any idea of what one of those costs today? I mean, at, at my time, I knew it was 25,000 pounds. Wow. At my time. So today it's probably, probably 50, 40, 50, whatever, but yeah, I, I have no, I have no idea. I think the technology think, and that thing, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, if you have a look at the amount of buttons and, and things on there, it's just insane. It um, is. But if you yeah, look yeah. back in the day of, of, of Senna and, and so on, they had, they had, they had the stick shift. Yes. One hand on the steering, one hand on the steering wheel and one hand changing. A tapered, a tapered hand here, here because of the blisters, because of the shift, and here because it was so narrow that you would, every time you shift, you needed the cockpit. Yeah, uh, I, raced for, I raced for one, two seasons and we had no hands device. It was, it was not a word. Uh, my, my my car had two planes of front wings. They had the, the main plane and another two flaps. Ferrari had the same, different design, but the same. Now uh, you see how many flaps they have, how many the deflectors, how many everything. It's it's crazy. It is yeah, it is crazy. The car is, so big. the car is so big. It's it's huge. The side the car is so long and so wide. The engine's so little, it's difficult to see what, uh, I, I don't know what is inside because we had big engines and the car was much shorter and more narrow. Now they have a very small engine. And I'm, I'm looking, I mean, I'm looking at your car, you know, car back then, you know, the, um, the, the arrows and- Yeah, you can see behind me, like you look like 
yeah. you know, on, the, on, the, on the picture on the wall. Yes, yes, that's yeah. the one. That's the one I'm actually actually looking at at right now. Yeah, on on my on my computer here. It, it had a very, like you said, it has, still has a very similar look to a Ferrari front with with the the side panel. Yes, the dashboards. Yeah, dashboards were. Now I think if you take a, a Max Verstappen car or lose him, the dashboards here beside the beside the legs of the driver to clean the the, the flow of the air. I don't know, but I, they might have sixteen little something like 16 little flaps little wings yes. and it's, it's all over i, I had i had a, a close look at, at the uh the rb14 i think it was in in monaco there max's car from 2018 or 17 and it's almost like they have like these like strange wires holding the 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 wing together you know the front the front wing together it's like a very bizarre design you know i mean you can see why those things are just they're just smashed to bits the minute they touch they touch something yes right. yeah i don't know i don't know why the car is so big now i honest because uh if you see if you put you can you can search on the internet and you can see a comparison between a let's say 2002 car and 2001 car like looking from the top uh it's way longer and way wider they have a very small engine they have a v6 engine i think 1.5 liter. We had a V10, three liters. We had a huge fuel tank because uh, some cars had a fuel tank that would put 130 kilos fuel. Any car was smaller. When you were racing, um, and it was early 2000s, had they changed the fuel uh, regulation? Were you still getting refueled then, or? Yeah, refueled, yeah. I, I never, I never raced with the. Uh, we had to change tires and we had to to refuel. Uh, it was a minimum, minimum, uh, the, because the consumption was so high because we had so much power available. The consumption we were using a. Uh, let me see. We were using around three kilos, three and a half kilo kilos of fuel per lap. So the bigger the bigger fuel tank cars like Williams, Mercedes, uh, McLaren, Ferrari, they could do us in some tracks. They designed the car that everywhere they could do one stop if they needed. Aeros well had a, a smaller fuel tank. We had a 100 kilos fuel tank, and tracks like um, like Old Hockenheim, for instance, uh, Monza. We couldn't do a one-stop strategy. What was, what was Old Hockenheim? Was that about eight kilometers? It was, I think, close to seven. But uh, yeah, I think I think what they did to the track is a crime because honestly, for who is a passionate of racing, that track produces so much good races. It was so charming. You wanted to go into the forest. It, it was really nice. It was like going to, to the cars going 365 kilometers an hour 20 years ago. And people a little bit like a little bit like Le Mans. Yeah, yeah, a little bit like the and then you would have so little wind going all over the forest, and then you get into the stadium, boom, where supposedly it's very narrow, very tight, and you need downforce, and you you had no downforce, so the car always like this. So it was people say, Oh, only straight line easy. No, uh, because uh, you need a lot of uh, skill to drive inside the stadium because you had no downforce at all. Did you did you ever race Le Mans or have any plans to? No, no, no. it was not not your thing or just didn't happen. I was I was there. Or being honest, I was a lot of I was a very much a, a single seater guy. I, I raced trying to be a Formula One driver. Uh, I raced trying to be a Formula One world champion. I didn't manage. I've been a Formula One driver only, but. Uh, that was my dream. And uh, as soon as things went bad with Arrows, they went bankrupt. Uh, I stayed three years with BR Honda, couldn't get a seat. It sort of like demotivated me a little bit to, to pursue um, other challenges. Sort of, uh, it was difficult to find the, the same, um, the, like how is it, the same, yeah, the same eye of tiger that I had in those years uh because yes. formula one is just the ultimate isn't it anything yeah. anything below that is like i've been honest uh, sometimes people say you were stupid to say that because i threw away so many phone calls from top prototype teams while i, while I was still testing for br honda and people say 
but I was getting manufacturers calling from like Audi and saying, oh, do you want to come and test our prototype to go for Le Mans? And in my head, I was, no, I, I'm a formal, I want to be a, I was built to drive, I, my, my head, I wanted to drive Formula One and that's it. What do you most miss about, miss about um, for being a Formula One driver? I, I'm very competitive. I miss the competition. But I don't miss now because I know that uh, at age 42, I wouldn't have the reflexes. You would have to train me for a full year for me to get rid of my extra weight and to be fit come again. On, come on, Enrique. Al Alonso and Kimi are what, 40, 41? Yes, but you, without, without, uh, without him having the breaks, you know. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had in my career uh, quite a lot of breaks. I, I was in coma when I, was after, when I was in Formula 3. So that was a break. It's difficult to come back from a break. I still managed to be in Formula 1 then. The team went bankrupt. So I'm out for a year and a half. Come back. Still very motivated. I had a lot of driven inside of me. Then, but then go to IndyCar, then drive. So it's, you know, it's something that we would have to reset the time. I would, if I would see the chance, I would do it, whatever it takes to compete again at that level. But just to compete, let's say, the way also is a, is a subject that maybe you agree with me, to compete how Kim is doing now. Yeah. It's not, it's on me, you know. Uh, I like to, 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 I was, I was somebody that always put a lot of pressure in myself and, you know, I, I compare it, I compare it in a way of, and, and, you know, I, I, I like Kimi, I like Alonso, I like Sebastian, you know, so I don't have anyone I don't like because to be quite honest, I don't know them. So, you know, why should I have something, something mm -hmm. against them, but almost see it like a Roger Federer or a Rafa Nadal hanging around and being ranked. 50 in the world and and starting to get beat by guys that you know they shouldn't be be losing to i know now, now maybe that sounds disrespectful and to anybody listening but i want to remember roger federer rafael nadal as like grand slam champions that were unbeatable or you know you know what i mean not not slipping down the rankings and and so on and so forth it's it also you know it happened also in racing trust me uh schumacher came back three years with mercedes for what yeah, the vision, the dream was great. Schumacher, biggest record in Formula One, German making Mercedes win first time the world championship. The vision was great. But do, you think, do you think that he was the catalyst for getting Mercedes Petronas back uh, back to becoming a world championship team? Because uh, because he 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 was he was with Rosberg in in those early days was he a catalyst in the information and the knowledge that he gave the team I, i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure he because at the end of the day alistair uh, mercedes now it's the uh, the old bar honda it's the same factory in brackley the same engineers when uh the same engineers when i was there it's how come before they had the Honda engine, there was a lot of money. When my time, they had a, a thousand people working between the Honda and, 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 and BAR Honda. And they couldn't do it. I'm sure Schumacher gave them the method, the, the discipline, like a German, how to, he did that in Ferrari. Ferrari was not winning for 20 years, yeah, 30 years. They win. Were you at BAR Honda? Were you, you yeah? So so yeah. You, were you there at the same time as Jacques Villeneuve? No, after Villeneuve, I was at the same time uh, Button and Sato. Okay, I you know one of my memories when maybe late nineties was sitting one Wednesday afternoon at Kailami Racetrack in South Africa. And watching the BI, the BAR Honda team uh, uh, practicing, yeah. they're the only team there. I don't know why they yeah, chose yeah, winter, winter testing. Yes, they were the, they were the only team there and I for the winter testing because in Europe, uh, let's say, where can you test in February in Jerez in Barcelona? Yeah, but uh, the highest temperature during the day would be 15 Celsius, and the coldest. Temperature when you start 9 a.m. it's 
maybe two degrees, three degrees. Where do you race with those temperatures? Yeah. Nowhere. So that was the, the, the reason why to go to all the way to Kyalami. Plus, if you drive the car in a high altitude, uh, you get more information because you don't have the all the, the load, uh, aerodynamic load that you need because the air is more thinner. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't know this. So, the, air, it's so, so the, the overall load that the aerodynamic, let's say your wings, your wings, if they are very well designed, they hire the mechanical problems. They hide the mechanical problems because they load the car. You get a fantastic car, which is an aerodynamic car works well. If you have less aerodynamic pressure, the, you can see how much more you will use your tires how much more you can improve the mechanical and the suspension part of the car. Wow. There's also, yeah. I, did, they, I, did, they, I mean, they there's so much. They like the place. No, there is a reason. <laughs> there is so much. I, 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 this is what I love about the sport. There's so much I still don't know. I mean, I never knew that altitude had an effect on a car. Of yeah. course, altitude has an effect on athletes and it increases more red blood cells. And that's why athletes train at, at high altitudes. But I didn't know that the cars had an effect. I mean, you don't get downforce and the engine gets so weak. You feel so, it. The engine, so the engine, like the engine oh, oh, instead of going like pop, pop, the engine is way weaker. The only time we feel that in, the, in, a, in a season is when we go to Sao Paulo because Sao Paulo is a thousand meters high. It's half of Johannesburg, but the car is light and the engine is, is weak. What about Mexico City? Is that not too... I never drove there. That's pretty high as well, no? Yeah, it's high, but it's not from my, from my time. Right. Your prediction for Zunfort, your top three. Oh, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's the million dollar question right now. <laughs> I think Max, Lewis, I would put uh, Norris. I like okay. him. I think a track that would be new for everybody else. Normally, I'm uh, a little bit, I'm not saying the others are not. A little bit more talented driver, I think, can come up on top. I would put him there. And he's, I mean, the I would McLaren, like to see him there. I would like to see him there. He's very, he's very fast at the moment. Yes. Very, very and he's, fast. Yeah. And he plus he's a very nice guy. I, I would, yeah, that's that I'm talking about. I'm always been a guy that speaks a lot with his, with my heart. I would like to see look, Max Lewis will be there. And I would like to see the third place. Let's say that the winner, you know, there's the, there's the, weird, the winners and then they're the winner of the rest. I would like yeah. to see London Norris. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that one with Enrique Binaldi. And I hope the second half of the season is as good as the first. As always, this podcast is available on iTunes, Amazon Podcasts, YouTube, and via my website, alistomacore.com. Connect with me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Alistair McCall, Instagram, Be Champion Minded, and on Facebook, Alistair McCall page. As always, remember you were made for greatness. Now go do the work. Stay champion minded. 